Okay, so I guess we'll start off just like this. So uh, good afternoon to all of you. My name is Ali Shahan, but I am a fifth year political science student at the University of Alberta. And I think you'll realize that as I go through my presentation that uh, I am in political science. Uh, so today's presentation that I will be doing, uh, I've titled it The Dark Side to Captain America, How Unequal Access to Future Technologies Can Breed Turmoil. And so if you look at the picture right here, the image on the title, these are actually from the Marvel Universe. They're called Flag Smashers, and they quite literally were evil super soldiers. And so it shows how there is a evil element that's also possible to all of these future technologies. So a brief outline of the presentation that I'll be giving to all of you today, we'll begin with just a slight bit of general background. And in that, I will mention, you know, some of the pretenses that the paper or that this presentation will be based off of. And moving forward, we'll talk about the ethical implications of unequal access to future technology. And first, we'll discuss this at the individual level. Then we'll discuss how this plays a role in warfare. And then finally, at the international level. And then finally, the most important part of the presentation, in my opinion, is how we can remedy these problems and secure a positive future for ourselves and for humanity as a whole. So I'll begin with just the, a highlight. So the title of the uh, presentation actually involves ethical implications. So it would be important to, you know, mention what ethics even entails in the sense that I will be discussing it with. So for the sake of this presentation, we'll be using consequentialism as our basis for deciding whether something is ethical or not. And so this this view of ethics involves the idea that the goodness of an action is calculated through the consequences of that action. And so over here at the bottom, we have a image of the uh, of the trolley example. And so this is a prime example of you know consequentialism, where if you value what's what's good, uh, what the outcome is, then you know you have your answer for the trolley problem. And uh, in specific, we'll be using utilitarianism. So we want what's good for the greatest number of people uh, using this utilitarian lens. So when we start speaking about the individual, we want to discuss the history first, because the history can have a lot to do with what the future entails. And so in the history of the individual, we've seen various uh, mechanisms at play. We've seen a history of racism, sexism, classism, ableism, and currently we also see a digital divide. And this this guides our perception of what the individual is, and it shows us all of the all of the problems that uh, the individual has already experienced. And so, throughout this presentation, now we're going to discuss a future problem that can also exist. It would sort of be an extension of this digital divide issue. The first aspect that I'll mention is human genome editing. So what is this? Uh, genome editing, it allows for scientists to make changes to an individual's DNA. And I know some of you may be in medicine while I'm not. So, of course, all of you may have better information of this than I would. But from my understanding, it involves the idea that you can add or remove or customize certain parts of DNA. And from first first uh, glance at this, you could tell that it has a very, very great potential for benefiting humanity. There's a possibility of solving a multitude of diseases and even inherently getting rid of them entirely from human existence. But there is also the possibility of some negatives, which can be very, very dire for humans as well. So... With genome editing, there's the possibility that people can customize their children for certain desirable traits, to hide certain uh, other traits, to prolong their lives, uh, to prevent disease. And so I feel like 
this, this aspect of human genome editing, especially if it is only given to a certain part of society, then it can directly contribute to making society more and more stratified, leveling society into different groups. And so in this sense, society would essentially be made up genetically superior people and genetically inferior people. And this has a very, very, you know, scary possibility of, uh, of what it can entail. And so an example is a movie by the name of Gattaca. And this movie presents a possibility of what this uh, genetic editing can lead to. Uh, it's just one of the possibilities. So over here, we have just the trailer and I'll just play that for you as it does a good uh, job of visualizing what I am trying to mention. I just want to, can all of you hear that audio? The one that was just playing? I don't think so. You probably need to enable it. I'm sorry, I'm pretty new at Zoom. Yeah, I think that that maybe you don't absolutely need to show this. You can send us the yeah. link and we can watch For it. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. I'll forward I'll forward the link to all of you. But the movie essentially it describes a future where there is certain people who are genetically superior and they have access to a certain uh, form of life and quality of life that genetically inferior people do not get access to. Another aspect uh, at the individual level is transhumanism. This presents the possibility to use current and emerging technologies to augment human capabilities and improve human conditions. So ideally, transhumanism can eliminate factors like aging, illness, and essentially all human weaknesses. And what it can do for humanity is it can permanently enhance intellectual and physical conditions. So how does this translate to real life if there is uneven distribution? It would essentially lead to stratification again, discrimination and subjugation. There'd be an entire species of people who are superior to everyone else. And it once again presents a, a similar fate to the genome editing. Mm -hmm. Next, we'll talk about implications in warfare or uneven distribution. And for this, it would be important to highlight a, uh, a political theory by that goes by realism. In realism, the uh, theory, uh, it states that states are concerned with their own security. They act in pursuit of their own national interests and they constantly struggle for power. So it's important to remember this, that States in realism, at least, they're constantly struggling with each other in the international sphere to gain more and more power. So knowing this, it gives quite insight into how artificial intelligence and uh, nanotechnology, for example, would be used for states' personal you know, motives, essentially. So in, the regard, in regards to fully automated robots, for example, with artificial intelligence. If if some countries had access to artificial intelligence, robot uh, soldiers essentially, versus others who didn't, and there was a war that took place, it's quite obvious what sort of carnage would be caused. But also since there is no risk of losing human life with the implementation of artificial intelligence warfare, it, uh, it severely dehumanizes the act of killing and it sort of dehumanizes uh, the violence behind it. And so what this can do is it can lead to even further violence, essentially. In regards to enhanced super soldiers, so for example, let's talk about Captain America if he came to life. Uh, it leads to the dilemma of whether they're treated as humans or whether they're treated as weapons, ultimately. 
And then this is something that can be considered in the far future, the potential for neocolonialism. So colonialism in the past, what uh, certain states used was superior weaponry and unintentionally the spread of disease. So in the future, through the implementation of technologies like nanotechnology, it is possible that states can control both of these and make them one and the same. So disease can be used as a weapon. And so in this desire for expansion that the realist paradigm would remind us about, it can be so much more easily implemented and uh, you know used. Now at the international level, we already ex we see how much global inequality there is. You know, we have factors like food shortage, healthcare, digital divides. And so we see that while wealthy countries continue to rise, poor countries, they continue to fall short. And so if these future technologies were distributed unevenly amongst these countries, then what it would do is that it would only facilitate the wealthy countries to astronomically exponentially increase in their advancement while poor countries, while the global south would be left further and further behind. And as in the current time, uh, global south countries are used as essentially commodity frontiers to assemble commodities for the global north. In the case of uneven distribution of these technologies, that would only be uh, taken to an extremist extent, essentially. So this picture here, it shows uh, the site of the Rana Plaza. And this was a clothing factory in Bangladesh from around 2010. And it killed about over, over well over a thousand people. And so this shows how the global south is subjugated to the global north right now. And with the expansion of these technologies, the global north, if with the expansion of these technologies only to the global north, they would be able to subjugate the global south to an even more extreme extent. However, this is merely a possibility of what the future can entail. What's more important is how we move forward. And so one of the main idea and one of the main things that we would need to implement in order to successfully use these technologies for the betterment of humankind as a whole is to reform our institutions. Currently, the institutions that we have, they subject a majority, a great majority of the world to poverty, whether it's global institutions like the IMF or the World Bank. A lot of, uh, a lot of humanity right now is subjected to uh, poverty in order to fuel these institutions and the theories that uh, global economics functions on. So we require an, an overhaul of these systems to allow for equal distribution of technologies. And that is much, much more easier said than done, especially for humans to do when we have this capacity within us for greed. So this leads us to our next point that was mentioned by Dr. Solas in, uh, in one of our October Zoom meetings. And that was, you know, maybe in the future, at some point, it is possible that we allow for artificial intelligence to govern us. Over time, there is most certainly the likelihood that artificial intelligence will eventually develop intellectual and reasoning levels far beyond what humans have right now. And this can be used in favor of implementing justice, for example, throughout the world. And so at a time right now where human greed takes over the international sphere and where these technologies essentially under the control of humans, they will be essentially abused. With the leadership of artificial intelligence, there is the possibility that all of these technologies can be used for the greater good for all of society altogether. And so this is a very, very beneficial likelihood in this case all of these technologies they could they could um, eliminate disease they could prolong life and they could essentially reduce human suffering as a whole if they are evenly distributed what artificial intelligence holds the capacity to do 
finally, we have this idea of nos. And every time I see that word, I have uh, an impulse within me to say nu because of my French classes from grade one to 10. And so it took me quite a bit of practice to make sure that I say nos. So with, with nos, nos is a concept that was introduced by Michael Rogers in uh, an email from the future, notes of 2084. And so what this entails is essentially a global consciousness, something that develops over time, not overnight. And so it allows for a virtual civility, essentially. And it comes as a product of a revolution. It's something that will develop as time goes on, and it will be necessary for humanity moving forward. And so this global consciousness, this virtual civility, as proposed by Michael Rogers, it has the capability or the capacity to move us towards morality, collectively move us towards morality, so that the issues that we experience right now, all of the problems that I listed, whether it was at the individual level, whether it was in regards to warfare, or at the international level, all of these problems could be solved through this common global consciousness where everyone strives for the same goals and we move towards a common goal of morality rather than something you know motivated by greed essentially or individualism so this idea of noose or no my bad see i, I did already this idea of noose is uh is something that can guide the future towards prospects that are unimagined by humans essentially uh, at the moment and so something that humans would not be able to do at the moment but with the development of this global consciousness we would be able to work towards these uh, these issues that we foresee being solved and uh, you know all of these technologies being used in the favor of humankind and so this is what this is the future that we hope for uh, hopefully, rather than humans having control and, uh, you know, using their greed to essentially subjugate majorities uh, across the world. So with that, I'll uh, conclude my presentation. And, uh, you know, just at the end, I also have sort of a discussion uh, question or something to ponder on, uh, you know, throughout your day. But how can we contribute to influencing technology? or letting technology influence us to avoid the bleak outcome that was mentioned in the beginning and to ensure that we have the positive outcome that was mentioned at the latter part of this presentation. Okay. That, I'd like to thank you. Thank you. So any questions? Just please don't make them hard. That's my request. <laughs> I guess if you, if no one has any questions, then I could posit this idea towards all of you that uh, how can we right now contribute to this evolution of technology? How, what part can we play in ensuring that, uh, you know, we do not experience this grim, dark future of uh, anarchy and, you know, this dystopia that was mentioned in the presentation. What can we do as humans right now? Do, you, do any of you have any ideas or? Well, it, it starts with just believing that it's possible to have a utopian future. Um, and yeah, I mean, what, once you make that assumption, then the other parts of it are easy. But maybe, maybe it's, it's, it's hard to, to change one's mindset. But um, the first part of your presentation basically posits that um, all of humanity is sort of inclined to go toward a negative evil end for things and and that that's a rather sad conclusion about us as the human beings so maybe that's yeah. the reason you went into political science right 
in um, uh, political science, you presumably can change the future through uh, direct action as a politician, right? So, so is that so, yeah, your absolutely. hope? That uh, that is uh, it's a long shot, but that absolutely is the hope. So yeah. I was I was very glad upon taking this class as well. In our politics classes, often we only discuss the bad, the the horrible sides of humanity, and we analyze how you know negative all of humanity is. Essentially, we discuss all of these you know catastrophes that have taken place. But it was refreshing in this course to see this positive. Uh, light and you mentioned that there was there was a time where you were discussing how uh, humans I think it was in front of uh, Rich Sutton right. and you were talking about how humanity has this uh, will to move towards you know negativity and then he might have uh, you know strictly talked to you into a opposing view of that so I feel like this whole course of mine was you doing that to me essentially <laughs> and so i'm grateful for that okay i'm grateful for that yeah well that that's that's right we we have on video uh rich sutton teaching me about human cooperation and now i i've taught you so you you have to spread the word man so so more more Absolutely. people lear learn about this Okay, thank you Absolutely. very much, uh, Katarina. You. You're you're next. Yes. Uh, do you want to? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, can see that. You want to make it full screen? Uh, yes. Is it working? There we go. Yep, it's good. Okay, so my name is Katarina, and today I'll be presenting uh, about encapsulation of pancreatic islets, or in other words, can we hide from immunity? So let's start from uh, like very general information. Uh, we'll be talking about diabetes, and diabetes is one of the major health issues that has reached alarming levels. Today, nearly half of a billion people live with diabetes worldwide. According to International Diabetes Federation, uh, diabetes is one of the fastest growing global health emergencies of the 21st century. Global report on diabetes demonstrated that the number of adults living with diabetes has almost quadrupled from 1980s to 463 million in 2019. And this number is uh, going to increase to 578 million by 2030s and by 700 million in 2045. So major issue and we need to do something with this. So today we will be a little bit more concentrated on the type 1 diabetes. And type 1 diabetes, it's caused by autoimmune reaction in which uh, body's immune system attacks the insulin producing uh, cells of the islets of Langenkarst. And as a result, body produce very little or no insulin. Despite uh, a higher prevalence in the childhood, uh, development of type 1 diabetes might occur in any age. Uh, but still, uh, type 1 diabetes is uh, the most common chronic childhood disease. Also, diabetes uh, its a major cause of blindness, killed kidney failure, heart attack, stroke, and lower limb amputation, accordingly to World Health Organization. So, just a little bit on pathogenesis. So type 1 diabetes, it's, as I said, one of the most common autoimmune uh, disease. And activation of autoimmune uh, aggressive T cells uh, that mediate the destruction of beta cells, it's a multifactorial and uh, multifactorial uh, process. And at least uh, uh, three factors might be involved in the destruction of beta cells. So first factor is uh, genetical successibility. It's uh, uh, 
required to uh, to create environment for type 1 diabetes development. Second factor is uh, several environmental factors might take a role in uh, uh, development of uh, type 1 diabetes, such as um, uh, Coxsackie virus or enteroviruses. And lastly, third factor, uh, the structure, destruction of insulin producing cells by a sufficient numbers on, in, of inflating autoaggressive T cells uh, leads to development of type 1 diabetes. So let's go a little bit from a history. It's, here is a, a lot of interesting uh, moments here. So the discovery of insulin, it's the most important medical discoveries of the 20th century. And this discovery, it's also the most celebrated Canadian discoveries of the 20th century. So in early, early 1920s, or to be exact, in March 1923, 22nd, sorry, Frederick Banting and uh, Charles Bass uh, discovered an insulin under uh, directorship of John McLeod at the University of Toronto. And with help of James Collin, uh, insulin was purified and making it available for a successful treatment of diabetes and a broad use. So Banting and McLeod uh, earned the Nobel Prize in, for their work in 1923. And an uh, interesting fact here, uh, Frederick Banting is uh, the youngest medicine laureate he ever. He won a Nobel Prize at the age of 32, which is amazing and incredible. Uh, so, but uh, we did a big progress in the delivery of insulin. We go from an insulin syringe to an insulin pump right now. And, uh, but still for over a hundred years or like for a hundred years, actually, we using just an insulin as a gold standard. It's still a gold standard for treating diabetes and insulin is just a symptomatic treatment. We just treating the symptoms. We're not treating a disease fully. So what we can do with this? So there is two roads to glucose normalization. And uh, first it's using artificial pancreases. Uh, which is uh, very modern and uh, uh, good working. Uh, but if you can see what IELTS transplantation offering, it's a very big difference, yes. So uh, the graphics here showing the uh, glucose tracing of a diabetic patient uh, before using artificial pancreases and after and maintenance it's still not maintenance of the glucose still not great so we want this to be tight nice graft and not with the fluctuating a lot and for islet transplantation uh, it's very big progress yes and uh, islet transplantation represent an innovative and effective therapeutic strategy to restore physiologic glycemic control for patients with type 1 diabetes who suffer from a severe multiple hypoglycemic episodes, uh, despite insulin being a gold standard in treating diabetes, there is still, as you can see, some issue in maintenance of uh, blood glucose. Uh, so, and what is the most noticeable in this graph, especially in this graph, it's this episode of hypoglycemia or low sugar, low blood glucose uh, between 3 and 8 a.m. And this is the most dangerous uh, condition that because because it's a uh, patient between 3 and 8 a.m. they are asleep, you know, and uh, they cannot feel this hypoglycemia. They cannot take any sugar or any other glucose, nothing to restore their normal glycemic control. And, and this situation can lead to a death in bed syndrome where patient just dying in the middle of the night. Uh, so for this patient, right now, islet transplantation, it's a way to maintain their glucose. And this is the result after islet transplantation, like glucose tracing after islet transplantation. And we have pretty tight glucose uh, control. Uh, so here I want to show you a, a results from... Um, the largest single center uh, cohort study of a long-term outco outcomes following uh, ILS transplantation. And on this graph, you can see a uh, um, graft survival over 20 years. And this is amazing how, like, how much graft is still survival. And on the next graph, you can see an insulin independence, which like 
um, a lot of patients after insulin uh, after eyeless transplantation uh, have an insulin independence, so they don't need any more of insulin injection. But over the years, it's, they still might require uh, insulin injection. But even if you can get rid of uh, that hypoglycemia events, which which was proven as well, it's still like a big progress in that eyeless transplantation can offer. So yes, with over a year with graph attrition, we have lower insulin independent, but still progress is very noticeable. Uh, so here I uh, want to show you some current clinical practices uh, and recommendation for uh, uh, for treating a patient with type 1 diabetes that have com complicate that has a complication by problematic hypoglycemia. And as you can see, eyeless transplantation is just a fourth line of the treatment. First line is just structured education and uh, multiple um, multiple days injection, and that's all. If this treatment fails, we go uh, to continuous uh, insulin injections and self-monitoring blood glucose. Uh, if this treatment fails, we go for artificial pancreases uh, with, a low, uh, with a low glucose. And if artificial pancreas would fail, we will go for eyeless transplantation. And why, did, why this is just a forced treatment? Because there is like with eyeless transplantation, we still require immunosuppression and the risk from immunosuppression uh, for some patients, it's greater that... Uh, that uh, progress that prones this, that uh, eyeless transplantation can offer. And just because of this, just because of the immunosuppression right now, just five or 10, from five to 10% of type 1 diabetes population is fulfilling this strict inclusion criteria. Um, so currently, uh, pancreatic islets are transplanted into the liver, but in order to maintain uh, glucose levels, two donor's pancreases are required for one recipient. Also, this method uh, has a risk of uh, uh, thrombosis, bleeding, and steatosis. Another disadvantage, it's a lack of uh, possibilities for imaging, biopsy, or retrieval of transplanted islets. In addition, as I said, islet transplantation require lifelong uh, toxic immunosuppression. Mm -hmm. Okay, and here I want to show you some hurdles um, for a beta cell replacement therapies. So first, it's a limited source of beta cells, and we can overcome this with the stem cells or uh, xenogenetic islands. Second, it's survival of transplanted beta cells, and we can work on this by protecting from ischemia and uh, accelerating vascularization. Uh, third, it's a need for life to lifelong toxic immunosuppression, and this can be overcome count with encapsulation. And uh, fourth one, it's a uh, fibrotic overgrowth and tissue overgrowth that uh, around the transplant that not allowing the transplant function properly. And this we can overcome as well with a different biomaterial optimization. So there is a way to, to work with all these problems. But in my understanding, if we can read can at least decrease or get rid of uh, immunosuppression. It already will be broadened uh, spectrum of type 1 diabetes patients that are eligible to, um, to get this beta cell replacement therapies. So the necessity for immunosuppression may be liquidated by using encapsulation devices that can prevent immune reaction and as a result, increase graft survival and maintain islet function. So encapsulation of pancreatic islets involves uh, loading of islets into a protective device or matrix with a semi-permanent membrane that allow exchange of molecules such as glucose, insulin, uh, oxygen, and other metabolism products, but at the same time act as a physical barrier from immune cells. And pancreatic islets follows two main approaches, macroencapsulation and microencapsulation. And uh, macroencapsulation involves loading all islets into a protective device uh, uh, and uh, placing this um, and transplanting this whole device. 
And uh, microencapsulation encapsulation involves encasing one or small number of islets into immunoprotective uh, structures. Microencapsulation is a little bit advantageous due to uh, increased area volume ratio, which is driven by commonly used spherical configuration of the structure. So let's go a little bit back. And macroencapsulation uh, devices, we can divide them into intravascular and extravascular. An intravascular uh, device, uh, they connect to a, a Arteriovenous, they connect to vasculatory systems through arteriovenous anastomos. And this type of a device, it's uh, very good because it's uh, so uh, it's provide adequate uh, oxygen supply, which is very important. So, and extravascular device, it's a simple planner device when we can uh, load islets in and uh, uh, transplant in under the skin or into peritoneal cavity. And here it's like, it will be just passive diffusion of nutrients and oxygen and insulin, which just rely on a passive diffusion and like good vascularization around this device. Uh, so just a short historical like overview. So this study back from 1977, they, uh, use uh, intravascular uh, devices and they did show uh, glucose maintenance as can be seen in this graft after like graft was removed they become hyperglycemic uh, again which is proven that this normal glycemia was 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 maintained by this device but there was a lot of complication with thrombosis, coagulation, and uh, arteriovenosis shunt rupture. And unfortunately, this study was stopped for like many years. But recently, recently, uh, it is like the acids provide like the most adequate oxygen supply. And it's like very promising if you just would think about this. Uh, it is like, again, new studies with the intravascular devices. And this new study shows uh, a pretty good uh, results with a, a new little bit different structure of the device. Plus, the study shows uh, very good results with a clinically relevant seeding density. Like, so they how to explain this? Uh, it's um, they show very big amount of uh, they put very big amount of islands in into a small space, but still able to uh, function, but still this islet is able to function just because they do have like very good oxygen supply because they connected to vasculatory system here. So maybe this approach would, would go and uh, uh, we will see this uh, goes into a clinical trial. Uh, so for a planner device, just uh, like the most uh, the most famous, I would say, a device. It's a, now it's called biocide. In previously, it's called teracide. So it's basically planner device when it's when you can load islets and they did have like several clinical trials and you rely just on passive diffusion, no immunosuppression. But this device fail in a clinic fails even before clinical trials. So they decided this company decided to make a pores in a device. And uh, so it's not any more uh, immuno, immunoprotective tag. Yes, it is required immunosuppression, uh, but they believe with uh, vascularization, with, if vascularization goes through the device, they would be able to uh, keep cells alive and uh, have functional cells inside of the device. And uh, uh, the latest, the, the latest uh, clinical trial, what is right now going, uh, they using, um, crisp cells like and they do have a vascularization and no immunosuppression so they using like stem cells uh, in a por porous device uh, uh, just like I think this is this like was the, the greatest discovery here and uh, here it's a result from a stage one clinical trial on a, a Beta air device. It's like this special device when they figure out like that planner, planner device, the biggest issue is oxygen supply, yes. So they developed like special device with the oxygen chamber and uh, they transplanted this into a four patients. And uh, 
but they uh, they pro they prove uh, after four months they uh, retrieve a device they prove that the beta cells survive inside of a device which is this is the beta cells yes with the data zone staining we can prove that this is beta cells yes but it was just the minutes levels of zipapide so they were they were in function uh, they do have a fibrotic tissue overgrow, and this is another another uh, hard loss why it didn't function. And so it wasn't impact on metabolic control, but it was like the greatest idea ever, I think. Uh, just a little bit on microencapsulation. Uh, so again, back in 1980s, we, uh, uh, Anthony Salmon Fim used alginate microcaps so uh, for uh, uh, to treat uh, diabetes in rats and they did the, pretty successfully uh, and this field of microencapsulation uh, grow from 1980 like pretty quickly and but this this study didn't require immunosuppression uh, and they use alginate poly polylysin capsules so just recently, uh, the most uh, like recent advantages in microencapsulation, uh, it's using uh, layer by layer uh, coating, and uh, they use uh, different layers of anion and cations, uh, and they use uh, hydrogen bonds, which is as well proven it's better uh, than uh, than electrostatic bonds. They started to use hydrogen bonds, and uh, uh, group by Hubert Se used these hydrogen bonds uh, of tannic acid and polyvinyl pyrrolidon, and they proved that it's protect uh, graft from uh, autoreactive T cell immunity and can uh, restore euglycemia in uh, in rodents. So um, again, uh, Dr. Hubert Se from Alabama used tannic acid and polyvinyl pyrrolidon uh, coating to protect from immune reaction and in in vitro studies, they uh, show uh, decrease in T cell uh, infiltration, and in vivo study, uh, they uh, they show uh, that uh, they maintain euglycemia in uh, in rats in mice. Sorry. So here I just want to show you that like how many clinical trials go right now. It's like amazing and all of them it's actually like most of them it's an encapsulated encapsulated islets uh with this i want just like remind you one more time that um uh, this is probably the most important uh hurdles that we need to overcome we need to overcome immunosuppression and this allow us to uh, like this is mainly what's not allowing us to bring this uh amazing treatment to broaden to broaden number of patients with type 1 diabetes. And here is my acknowledgement and references and I'm for a question. Sorry, I cannot hear you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, this uh, institution, of course, it has a long and proud history in this area. Um, so the Ed Edmonton Protocol and yeah. so on. And um, yeah, I, I think there will be still very important breakthroughs made here in, in the next while. Um, in this important medical condition. Are there questions for Katerina? So tell us a little bit, what was the timing of the Viacite trial? Because, you know, it's a funny thing about my regenerative medicine lectures, they all mention the uh, biocyte trial. So do you know when it began and then when it was clear that it wasn't working and so on? Uh, if I'm correct, it's begin like around the 2015. Right. 
Yeah. Uh, yes. And like they start like from with one with just and it's it's weird because like they change name uh, several times and it's hard <laughs> to you know like just to follow. Uh, right. So began uh, they begin just with a planner device. Um, I believe they already yes they study finished and they already proved and it's it's not working yes. So they start to do pores, but I don't. I believe by 2018 they mentioned yeah. that it's not working, and in 2018 they start a different study with a porous device, and right now it just, I believe it's like last year, last year they, last year or year before last, before, or it's 2021 or it's 2020 when they start, uh, with the steam cells. Yeah. Okay. Very interesting. Yeah, well, it certainly is local history. And, and, yeah, it's and, certainly a, a, lo yeah. a lot of local history. And Edmonton, right. it's, very, it's very famous right. in the right. ALS, but ALS transplantation field. Yeah. Okay, uh, other questions? Um, okay, well, we can then start our third presentation. Paola, you want to take us through your presentation? Well, we just need to make that full screen. Yeah. Can you see the presentation or is it just? Yeah, just the presentation. That's all we're seeing. No notes or anything. Yeah. Yeah, no. All right. <laughs> okay. So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Paula, and I will talk about the um, quantum theories, theories of consciousness and their implications for mind uploading. So uh, first of all, mind uploading is the idea to upload and store one's mind to a computer. And to know if this is feasible in like a practical setting, we need to really understand how the human brain and consciousness work. So we'll be talking about theories of consciousness in general with a particular focus on the quantum theories. But in order to do so, we'll also need some background of quantum mechanics concepts that will be useful to understand the quantum brain theories. So let's start with some general quantum background. Every object in quantum physics has a dual wave and particle nature, and this is the so-called wave-particle duality. And these particles are described in a probabilistic way by their wave function that gives the probability of finding the particle in a specific location in space. So these wave functions behave kind of like similar uh, to classical waves, so they can interfere with each other and they can form a superposition. That is the quantum superposition of states where we find the particle that is our uh, quantum system that is simultaneously in multiple locations or, or states. And then the superposition ends when an observation is made and one of the multiple states is chosen and the superposition uh, collapses into a classical state. And this is the so-called Copenhagen interpretation that says basically that an observation is needed to see the reality of the state. So quantum theories started to arise in recent decades and they tried to explain the origins of consciousness. And it makes sense to ask ourselves if quantum theory can help understand consciousness because it is the most fundamental theory of matter that we currently have. And among these theories, uh, three main approaches can be identified. The first one being the quantum brain theories that uh, basically states that consciousness is a direct manifestation of some quantum processes that are happening in our brain. Then quantum mind applies quantum concepts to understand consciousness, but makes no direct reference to the actual brain activity in the physical brain. And lastly, we have mind-master dualism that says that mind and body are distinct and we can separate them. 
Among the um, quantum brain approaches, uh, we have uh, Hamroth and Penrose's orchestrated objective reduction or OR uh, theory that is perhaps one of the most famous and well-known. Uh, it posits that uh, consciousness depends on quantum processes that are happening within the microtubules in our brains, especially in the neurons that are in our brains. So before jumping into consciousness and delving into deep, let's have a look at what microtubules are and what the role is in our brains. Uh, they are part of the cytoskeletal filaments in the cells uh, that are basically the scaffolding that preserves the shape of the cell and helps in its movement and in its functions. They are shown in yellow here in this beautiful image. And uh, from like, a chemical point of view, they are biopolymers. So polymers that are formed by uh, subunits of alpha and beta tubulin proteins. And one of the most unique properties of these microtubules is the dynamic instability. Uh, basically, they are able to uh, self-organize by disassembling and reassembling their uh, tubulin subunits in a uh, synchronized way. What is most interesting for us is that they form uh, some elaborate networks in neurons. And these networks are um, connected and stabilized by the microtubule-associated proteins. And there are studies that has shown that damage to these proteins and in general to the cytoskeletal filaments inside the neurons is linked to uh, cognitive impairments, so neural uh, degenerative diseases, among the others. And microtubules are also indirectly linked to the synapses, so they play uh, a role in, say, our cognition. And uh, actin filaments link the microtubules to the synapses, and actin are other cytoskeletal filaments. And microtubules also interact with the ion channels, and their surface is uh, decorated by C termini, that are some small peptide chains that are uh, very flexible and highly charged. So we have different mechanisms that have been proposed to explain this idea that microtubules are um, basically some kind of computers that can store and process information inside our brains. Some are uh, the oscillation of the C termini that, as I said, are flexible uh, chains so they can switch positions. Uh, then uh, electrons hopping or jumping from a uh, positively charged area on a microtubule to another uh, area. Uh, the excitation of the tryptophan residues in tubulin the change in the conformation of the uh, tubulin dimers, interactions between uh, dipoles, and uh, lastly, phosphorylation, that is a biological signaling method. Among these, uh, the tryptophan excitations are of particular interest for us because each alpha-beta tubulin dimer contains eight of these tryptophan residues. And these centers have a dipole moment that makes them able to uh, act as a chrome force. So they can uh, transfer energy. Uh, if we excite them with ultraviolet light, they can either re-emit this light or transfer the energy they absorbed to other tryptophan uh, residues in the vicinity. And this re-emission of light, interestingly, is delayed by um, an amount of time that uh, is comparable with the time that our brain takes in the information, pro information processing. And this, uh, so this delayed re-emission of light is a phenomenon called uh, delayed luminescence. It has also been found that uh, from a biological point of view, it is possible to transmit information through this mechanism of energy transfer through chromophores in a similar way to the quantum effects that have been observed in photosynthesis. 
and that basically gave the rise of the whole quantum biology field. In fact, there is a striking parallel between the eight tryptophans that we see in the alpha-beta tubulins and the seven light harvesting uh, centers that uh, have been identified in the photosynthetic complexes in the chloroplasts of plants, for example. So microtubules play a central role in uh, Penrose and Hameroff's theory of consciousness, the ORCH-OR, that postulates that the origin of consciousness is found within the microtubules in the brain. So the idea is that these uh, tubulin subunits uh, in the microtubules exist in, transiently exist in a uh, quantum superposition of states. So in this sense, we can see the microtubules has kind of some uh, quantum computers in which uh, each of these superpositions is a quantum bit, a qubit. And these tubulin qubits interact with each other and eventually collapse to classical states once uh, an objective time threshold is reached that is linked to gravity. So the Ortoir theory states that inside the brains, there are biological conditions that uh, orchestrate uh, the collapse of the qubits, and uh, these collapses then result in conscious events. In uh, the words of one of its own authors, this theory is the most complete and yet most easily falsifiable theory of consciousness. And uh, indeed, uh, some experimental tests were performed to assess different aspects of this theory. Uh, in 2020, there was an experiment that was conducted that put in doubt the role of the uh, gravity uh, in, in the quantum collapse that happens uh, of these tubulin qubits. But on the other hand, there were some other recent experiments that involve uh, anesthetics binding to microtubules and tubulin. And they showed that these drugs reduce the phenomenon of delayed luminescence. So they support the idea that microtubules might harbor consciousness. Into mind uploading that has a prominent spot in the current view of transhumanism this is the belief that we as a species can evolve and overcome our biological limitations through uh, advancements in technology. The whole idea of mind uploading is to upload and store the human mind to silicon thus reaching a sort of digital immortality. This theory is undeniably fascinating and there are plenty of recounts and myths about the means to achieve immortality throughout the human history. Let's think about, for example, as uh, the fountain of youth or the Christian Holy Grail or the belief in reincarnation. And, and we can see a uh, sort of uh, parallel between mind uploading and we can see it uh, as a sort of reincarnation into a digital medium. But when we think of mind uploading, what comes to mind is how you would upload a uh, picture or a document file to an ordinary computer. So if the file is the human mind, this would make sense, just if the mind itself was a piece of software. And in, the, in this case, uh, practically, we could upload the human mind to silicon. It would be feasible, but still likely difficult. <laughs> However, uh, if we accept uh, the Penrose and Hammer's theories, we can argue that the functioning of the human brain is not explained. It, it's not explainable just in an algorithmic way. So given that the mind is not literally a piece of software. An alternative solution that's been debated recently would be creating a detailed computer simulation of an individual's brain. An, an individual's brain. So uh, this um, computer simulation, rather than an uploading, uh, would be an artificial copy of one's mind. And at the present time, uh, practically, we are limited in uh, giving rise to such a simulation because uh, the level of complexity we would need to obtain 
a faithful copy of someone's mind that has uh, the exact same uh, patterns of uh, information processing that, that give rise to the exact same emotions and character is very large. And we are also limited by our lacking knowledge of the inner workings of the human cognition. And also, if we add to this the possibility that quantum processes are involved uh, in the making of consciousness, uh, we add a layer of complexity to the matter. And another aspect is if we put this kind of practical limitations to the side and we imagine that one day we do agree on a general model of the human mind, still to have a faithful copy of one particular person's mind, we would need to get exhaustive knowledge about uh, this person's brain in particular. And obtaining this kind of exhaustive knowledge might entail like prodding it in a way that would damage the physical brain. And this would give rise to some uh, ethical, it, it would be ethically dubious at best, even if the idea is to do it uh, with the intention of reconstructing the mind in a sort of immortal setting. Um, let's discuss this concept of immortality a little bit. So uh, let's imagine that we have overcome all our technological and uh, practical problems we have uh, at this point, and we have the knowledge, the technologies and the resources uh, also the computational resources that are needed to obtain a perfect copy of a person's brain that would be a digital copy existing in a simulation. Does this sound a little bit familiar? Um, sir, the Facebook rebranded as Meta last year. Uh, the, this metaverse became even more of a buzzword and um, a metaverse uh, is a mix of uh, virtual and mixed reality. It allows people to interact in real time over distance by other avatars that are sort of like their digital identities. So the idea of a global simulation where our copies would exist and interact uh, is not that distance from it. But would we really feel differently about our physical death? Uh, even if we know that we have a digital twin that lives or exists in this simulation. Um, we can think as this digital copy uh, rather than a transcending of death or an extension of life as another instantiation of myself, not a substitute. So a digital copy of one's mind would be identical to the biological one, but just in the very moment it is created and then it would go on to uh, live in the simulation and interact with other digital minds and maybe experience different things from the biological person. So create new memories and ultimately would explore an alternative path rather than extend this person's life. But their memories up to, the, up to that point would still be there. So when the digital copy is created, the, while the biological person would know they are, are the original, uh, the copy has the exact same memories. It has uh, the exact same character of the person, uh, uh, feelings and emotions. So they would feel the same way. They would not know they are the copy and would feel like entitled to uh, the person's identity just as the biological one because they are that person at that moment so then if we were to coexist with our copies it might be necessary to communicate to these digital minds that uh, in fact they are a copy and the original mind is still around with a body attached to it so imagine you have you wake up one day and and somebody tells you that you haven't really lived all those memories you have because 
you just came to existence and your memories are sort of a backup. Uh, how would one react to that? And would we like to be that copy or would we like to have to tell our copy something like that? So to wrap up, in theory, mind uploading could be possible if uh, we reach the appropriately sophisticated technologies. Uh, however, we have some uh, limiting factors for it to happen just yet, uh, such as the uh, required level of knowledge of uh, the tiny bits and the inner workings of our brains, and the level of complexity that this entails, especially if we consider the quantum component in the making of consciousness. And secondly, there are ethical considerations about the desirability of mind uploading. And lastly, if we reach this level of, of advance, uh, advancement, sorry, that allows to duplicate our minds without damaging our biological brain, we would still have to deal with doubles of ourselves that would be entitled to our same identity. And this would uh, give rise to a whole another list of potential legal problems and ethical considerations. So this wraps it up. I'd like to thank you for your attention. Great. So any questions? So, you know, the other side of this is multiple instances of self, which has been a theme in this course for many years. And you know that during the pandemic, I had uh, 17 choroplast cutouts of students in my office oh, yeah. when we couldn't get together for real. But yeah, and that was because the students in 2020 all got uh, choroplast cutouts of themselves. And Taryn Stokowski, the main TA for the course, has at her home five images of her, including one Hi. where she poses between the two cardboard cutouts and then we made a new card cardboard cutout of that so an inception uh, of cutout yeah yeah That's so really there, cool. there there are six of her at her house and she puts them in in like uh, creepy and unexpected places and the the garage to frighten you <laughs> and so on yeah but okay. yeah i kind of want to do that <laughs> yeah and um so my granddaughter who did the video with, with me about mind uploading, she was seven at the time of that video and she's nine now. She's much more practical and conversational than she was back at the time of that video. But the deal about her is if Ray Kurzweil, and you have watched a very, very long <laughs> Ray Kurzweil video recently, if Ray Kurzweil is right, he says that in the 2030s, mind uploading will be widespread and successful. And what that means is that magic age of 29, I don't know if you regard that as being a magic age, but a lot of famous people most of their quotes are from the age of 29. It's like that's the, the intellectual peak that you're all aiming for. And she would right. never get there, you see, if it's true that most people upload themselves in the 2030s, she would probably upload herself before the age of, of 29. And so we never get those, those very wise quotes from my Granddaughter, yeah. So, um, so seriously, I think that Ray Kurzweil is uh, probably the best predictor of the future. But this is an area where he he got things sadly wrong, not because of technology. 
but because of human psychology that I think people could not cope with the psychiatric effects of having two of yourself or not, or having a consciousness without a body and so on. It's, it's just not feasible by the 2030s to have humans accept that. And no psychiatrist would be able to, to keep humans sane, you know? They'd all go crazy. Well, how do you deal with that? Yeah, yeah. They'd all go crazy without a biological body. So I don't kind of, think we're ready. No, we are to not. give it up, you know. Yeah. Ali or Katarina, what are your thoughts about this? Is is this what you want to do? And do you want to do it before age 29? Or <laughs> what do you think? It's uh that's certainly a I mean, I need more than 10 minutes to think about that decision. <laughs> but uh no, I feel like I feel like it, it certainly presents its advantages. And I guess once there's probably going to come a time where it's going to start becoming the norm. And so, I mean, if we if we make it to that point, then I guess it won't be much of a choice that you have. You, you'll, you'll be out of the ordinary if you're choosing not to partake. So, yeah. Well, you see, think, think of my career choice then. You're probably all thinking about career choices. So like I'm in kidney medicine. Well, what if everybody's uploading their consciousness to ceramic slabs? They won't have kidneys. No all need this, for that. All this knowledge that I hold about kidney medicine be completely worthless at the time when all human beings are uploading themselves to ceramic slabs. I should have stump studied something more practical <laughs> than kidneys, right? Yeah. So any yeah, other another... thoughts about this? Okay, well, I want to thank the three of you for taking the course this term. And you, you realize that I plan to not have the course occur this term. So it's really the three of you that changed my mind and decided that this was the course that couldn't die, you know, even in a in a semester when I chose not to do it, that, that the course had a, a, a life of its own and wanted to continue. So thanks for being part of that. So if you're interested in what it's like next term, of course, you, you would know how to visit the class and, and stuff. Uh, there's a long tradition of people, um, you know, um, coming back and, and taking part in the course if you ever wish to do that, even on a one-time basis where you could report on what it was like uh, to, to take the course um, in, in the one term when, when there really were very few live lectures and, and so on. Um, so, yeah, okay. I just, Dr. S I just want to say thank you as well to you for, you know, taking time yeah. out of your busy schedule and allowing for us to take this course. So it was really beneficial for me, at least, and I'm sure it was for my, my classmates as well. So thank yeah. you very much. Well, no, you're, you're, you're welcome, and there are mm -hmm. medical students who have also benefited. So we had a significant number of students. I mean, often we've run the course with five students, and we basically kind of had that between the three of you and the two medical students. So it's the usual con contingent, in a way. We already have five students for next term but if any of you have friends or any anything who you think would be interested they they could certainly join the course okay so i i should be able to generate your grades pretty quickly now um there there is a higher level of of approval of course so 
I recommend grades and then there's there's an approver at, at the level beyond. I've been doing this for quite a while now. So usually what I, I suggest is, is the final grade, but yeah, probably within the next week, uh, the grade should be finalized. So any other questions or uh, comments? I just want to say same thank you to you for keeping this course course open and so we can have sure. it. Sure. Yeah. Oh, I plan to keep it open now forever. So anyway, as, as long as I'm around, it will be around. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you all okay. very much. Okay. Take care now. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all Simmons. for the interesting. All right. Thanks.